watching the award-winning GHS-TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome to Public Square, a new show about what is happening in our corner of the world. Throughout history, public squares were centers for discourse, dialogue, a place to exchange ideas and tackle the important topics of the day. They were where people gathered to engage in civic life. They were places of commerce for both goods and ideas. They were witnesses to trials and tribulations of the people who entered. They were the pillars of society. I'm Jerry Green, and I'll be your host on Public Square. A lifelong Memphian and an active member of this community, I hope to act as a guide as we delve deep into the pressing issues of our time. Each episode of Public Square will highlight a current concern, explore the realities, and then provide you, the viewers, with action steps you can take, action steps for true civic engagement. So thank you for joining me in this Public Square. Let's get started. Today's topic, food insecurity. Over 370,000 people in the Mid-South are currently food insecure. Food banks are reporting incredible strain as their roles have doubled since March of 2020. And the rate of child food insecurity is 21.6% since the pandemic began. These are the facts, but not everyone knows them. Last fall, I took pictures on my way home of a food line near my district. It stretched for blocks and blocks, hundreds of cars full of our neighbors waiting for food. I shared it on my social media with a call for action. It broke my heart. What hurt more were the comments I received on the post. Many people called it fake, claimed it was full of freeloaders, and left other hateful false comments. So today, I want to get to the truth. Please let me introduce you to Brian Manis, the director of the Mobile Food Bank, which was captured in my photos. Thank you for coming, Brian. First, I think it's fair to tell people that the food line, I know about it because I spent a day working it with you, about five hours out there. Yes, you did, in the heat. <laughs> it was, it was warm. So what I saw was a really a Herculean effort. There were dozens of volunteers. They were there for setup beforehand, and I left after five hours, and the line was still there and still going. So tell me about your food bank. We have uh, been doing the food bank now. It's, it's actually one year this week for us uh, here at Colonial Park. We've got, uh, we do it uh, currently every first and third Thursday of each month. Uh, we serve about uh, 400 actual households which actually, the, by the way, food is calculated equals about 500 households when you uh, count uh, the number of people. So it's, uh, it's really amazing. We have about 40 volunteers every single drive and cars start lining up as early as uh, 1030 the night. Yeah, and the people in the cars, I know I saw elderly couples, I saw disabled people, I saw single mothers with a car full of kids, I saw veterans who were thanking me for being out there and helping them. Tell me about the people that you serve. It is really a wide variety of folks. You've got people from all over Memphis that come uh, to these uh, food drives, and uh, you've got all sorts of circumstances. You've got folks that just lost their job last week, some that uh, have been unemployed for a while, some that are, are just down on their luck for now. Uh, so it's really, uh, it's really amazing to see the, the types of people who are all so appreciative, like you said, to, for us serving. And we're so thankful for them and especially the veterans and those folks that, uh, that are out there serving us that, uh, that come through the line. And, and it's, it's really a, a touching day every time we, we have these. I agree. And, you know, that's what was so shocking to me after I posted about it. And people were talking about people being freeloaders because there were nice cars in the line. And I remember the day that I came out and volunteered, you told me about a man who had a car full of kids and was in a Jaguar. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I had a, had a, a gentleman who, who really wouldn't look me in the face right at, at first and had several kids. And uh, he was in a really nice car and uh, 
And so a couple of times I'd passed him a couple of times and uh, as I'm walking up and down the line and uh, and finally we make eye contact and I, I say hello and um, and and he's really almost in tears and uh, and he had lost his job the week before and didn't know how he was going to put things together uh, was almost embarrassed to be there and sad for his situation I'm, I'm too prideful almost and I was like look man uh, we've all we've all been there. We've all had some situations where that have come up where we need some help. I'm just really glad you chose to come to, to Colonial Park and and come through our line, uh, and that put him a little bit at ease. Uh, we've seen him a couple of times since, and uh, he's been very appreciative. But uh, it really, uh, you never know. You know, I, all those people that complain about the man, their car is nicer than mine. We really don't know their situation. We don't know. Uh, what's going on in their world or what uh, battle they're fighting. So uh, you can't judge. You know that you're here to help and, um, and you take it as they, as they come. Um, so you say you've seen him a few times. I assume you see people multiple times. Uh, about mm -hmm. how many people? I think you said 400, 500. I was there for about five hours. And I remember you told me as I left to count the telephone poles. Can you tell people a little bit about that? <laughs> Yeah, when, when it gets down towards the end of our day, we, we really struggle to make sure that we have enough food in the, in the lines and never want to turn anybody away. Or at the same time, if we're, if we're running really low, uh, if I can save somebody a little time and tell them where they can go tomorrow, if I know we're going to be out of food, and, unfor and fortunately, that's only happened once. But uh, if people are going to wait in line, and we're not going to have any food. I want to go ahead and, and tell them, hey, we're going to be out and you can go here tomorrow. You can go to another place tomorrow and give them that location. And so we start counting cars. Uh, we officially end at one o'clock and we start counting cars about 1215. And the way we do that is through the light poles. Between the light poles on Park Avenue, you can average about seven cars. And so I started counting the light poles and uh, that gives me my, my car count for the rest of the day. Well, I do remember when we started, I was so surprised at the, the type and amount of food that was being offered to these families. There was fresh produce and canned goods and frozen meats. Just give people an idea of, of what these cars get when they show up. Okay, when, when we never know exactly what food we're going to get until the morning of, uh, when the food bank, Mid-South Food Bank does an amazing job to pack these trucks full. We get about 22,000 pounds of food each of those food drive days that fill up anywhere from 20 to 24 pallets. And they're gonna get some protein, they're gonna get some produce, a wide, uh, some sort of a breakfast item, and then kind of a miscellaneous other stuff. It may be canned fruit, it may be um, canned like tuna or uh, bags of pasta or rice or dried beans or any number of things and uh, so but each family each household gets uh, about two weeks worth of food and so it, it's amazing quality the food bank and the people who donate to the food bank really really do an amazing job their purchase power is, is incredible so if there are people out there who want to get involved like I did to come be a part of this amazing mission that you guys, this service that you're providing to our community members in need, can you tell us how we can all get involved? Yes, please. Uh, you can call me directly at Colonial Park United Methodist Church. Uh, that's 901-683-5286 or you can call or email me at B Manus, M A N E S S at colonialpark.org. Uh, it takes us about 40 volunteers each of the food drive days to make it work. Uh, we have uh, several stations of, uh, of food distribution and we need all the help we can get. Uh, so we have a couple of shifts, um, 8.30 to 11 and then 11 to 1.30 are the main distribution times with setup before starting as early as six in the morning and then a cleanup time that ends about 2.30, 30 Yeah, and I would 30. say the only thing I would tell people is you better be able to lift heavy stuff because <laughs> there was a lot. There, there is a lot, but now uh, with that, we've actually got some stuff. You don't have to really lift anything. If you can open some bags, we can get uh, open those little blast, those plastic uh, like Kroger bags 
there is something for anybody to do. We've got folks that, uh, that come out here to serve that are 85 years old and they are here every single time and they can't lift anything, but they are here to serve and they are so glad to do it. Everybody plays a part. Tell me about the need. And to me, it just seems overwhelming and unending. And I know that when the pandemic happened and people were losing their jobs and there was obviously um, a cry for help in our community and you stepped up, but do you see the demand going down? I wish I could say yes. Um, the need is going up. Uh, so many of the distribution sites over the last year have stopped um, for various reasons. And so there are now fewer places uh, that distribute the food in these mobile or emergency mobile food pantry lines. There are fewer places to get those food, that food. So, um, so on our level, the need is, is still there. And we've committed to go through the end of, of 2021. And if the need still is there in 2022, I know that we're gonna step up and do it as well. So uh, the need is not going anywhere anytime soon. Tell me personally why you do this. Oh, yeah. Um, it's all about helping our neighbors. It's all about helping those in need. Um, and I know there's been times in my life where I've needed help. And there's probably going to be times in the future where I need help again. And so people have helped me in the past. And so I try to help others. And as a part of our church, as a part of uh, what we're called to do, it is all about loving your neighbor and helping those around you. And so what we want to do is show that love uh, to everybody around us. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter uh, about anything in your background. You are going to get helped here, and we are going to do the best we can to show you that love. Well, I am so grateful for what you're doing. I am grateful for the volunteers. I am grateful for the food bank that helps supply it. And I'm grateful for the people that show up when they're in need and, and take advantage of the service that you are providing them. And so I wanna thank you for coming on today and thank you for continuing to do what you're doing because we need you in this community now and probably in the future. And I hope people get in contact with you and get involved because this is important. It is such a basic thing for people to be able to put food on the table for their family and you're helping do that. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you. I hope we see you again in the future and thank you for getting helping get the word out. You're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> right. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate your time today. Oh, you're so welcome. Have a great day. You too. Please stick around. We'll continue our conversation on food insecurity when we come back. Did you know college debt is the second largest type of consumer debt in the U.S.? Why? Because the required interest paid on student loans causes you to give more than you receive. So why not prevent taking out student loans altogether? Learning how to manage your money is a great way to solve that problem. And there are many tips online to get you that head start. Don't wait until you're drowning in debt. Make college affordable now. watching the award-winning GHS TV, a nationally recognized student television station. Welcome back to Public Square. I'm Jerry Green, and this month we're discussing food insecurity. Elena De La Vega has a PhD in an MSW and is the Associate Professor of Social Work at the University of Memphis, where she teaches social welfare policy, evaluative research, and poverty. She is the author of the Memphis Poverty Fact Sheet, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But first, let's welcome Dr. De La Vega. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. I am looking forward to the complete end of the pandemic and be able to sit with you. <laughs> well, I would love that too. Um, I invited you here today because we are talking about food insecurity and I thought you would give us a good overarching view of poverty in our area and how that intersects with 
food insecurity. So can you tell us a little bit about what poverty looks like in our area? Well, poverty, as we know, is and has been very, very high. Right now, the city of Memphis has an overall poverty rate of 21.7% with a child poverty rate of 35%. However, and this is incredibly important to keep in mind, this is pre-pandemic. All of these are pre-pandemic numbers. And we know that the pandemic impacted particularly people with low incomes. We know that uh, those jobs disappear in a much greater percent. We also know that uh, the ability of people with low wages to spend any money on their basic necessities uh, disappeared with the pandemic. So uh, we'll see what's going to happen post-pandemic. This is what it looks like right now. Two things are historically true about the, uh, the poverty rate in Memphis. The first thing is poverty is high and it is much higher among minorities. African Americans and Hispanics have tremendously high poverty rates and um, non-Hispanic whites tend to not have poverty rates that are anywhere comparable. In fact, the poverty rate for non-Hispanic whites is in Shelby County is much lower than the national average for non-Hispanic whites. So the disparities are terrible and glaring. But yeah, the that, other thing... Yeah. I'm sorry, yes. that was one of the things I noticed in your poverty fact sheet was the fact that comparable to other cities in, and counties around the country about our size, the disparity among the races in poverty is much greater here in Memphis. Yes, so that, that is an important thing to remember. Uh, and the second thing is that looking at poverty over time, what we see is that it is pretty constant. So it doesn't really matter what's happening. Poverty in Memphis is high, and it is much higher for minorities than for non-Hispanic whites. And the disparities are pretty consistent. But the, if you look but at the, the I'm sorry, the, oh, I'm sorry. the <laughs> pandemic was sort of a perfect storm. Right. I Absolutely. noticed one of the things that you said is um, because poverty rates also very high among children in our area. And you say children are poor because their parents are poor. And it's really that simple. And it when is. you think about what happened in the pandemic, especially around children and around their food insecurity for so many who get their food from schools being at home, um, it, it was really a perfect storm. Absolutely. So um, to go back a little bit um, to what is food insecurity? Food insecurity is an inability to obtain enough healthy and nutritious food to meet your needs or to be able to afford your other necessities and food at the same time. So what ends up happening is that food is the one thing that tends to go because people can save money by buying non-nutritious food. So those are some of the things that happened. So uh, with the pandemic, 80,000 children that go to public schools when the schools closed ended up not being able to obtain any food and their parents being in poverty did not have the resources to provide the food. Uh, yes, poor children are poor because their parents are poor. So if we, need, if we want to end poverty, what we need to do is to support families. How do we support families? We support families with housing. We support families with food programs. We support families with jobs programs and high enough wages so that people can actually afford to eat. That was actually the actually. next question I was going to ask you is there's a lot of debate in the public right now around unemployment benefits and around living wages. Can you tell us what your opinion is on the effects of that on poverty in our area and thus food insecurity? Um, so unemployment benefits help with food insecurity by allowing poor people to afford to buy food and eat. One of the things that is important to remember is that putting money in the hands of the poor, so a blanket stimulus, doesn't help anyone because 
people who are wealthy enough do not need the money are simply going to put the money in a bank account where it's going to not help anybody in the community. But putting money in the hands of the poor results immediately in that money result, uh, returning back to the community. And the first thing that people in poverty and families and mothers in poverty do is buy food for their families and food for their children and the necessities that their children have, uh, such as shoes and you know paying rent and other things remember when people have to make a choice between paying for rent and feeding their family a lot of the times they go okay i'm going to pay all of the rent and then everybody's going to eat um spaghetti with margarine all month because that's all that we can afford so that's you know the food insecurity is connected to all other needs not being met well, you touched on mothers there, so I want to follow up that as a mother. Um, and I know that during this pandemic in particular, women and mothers were very hard hit when it came to employment. And now those women are um, suffering in poverty and their children are thus suffering in poverty as well with food insecurity. What can we do to help women reenter in the workforce? So the first thing that we need is to actually have childcare, um, subsidized childcare. If people don't, women in particular, um, do not have access to childcare, they are not able to join the labor force. The other thing that we need to do is remember that mothers have two shifts, two jobs. And so we have low wages, women are working extremely hard, they're not able to afford their basic necessities. We have a dismal transportation system in Memphis, which means that uh, going to a job that maybe taking a car would take 15 or 20 minutes will take two hours out of a woman's life. Um, women are suffering the most, but when women suffer, their children suffer. International research has shown that women utilize the resources for their children. Mm -hmm. But when women don't have any resources, economic, emotional, social, they don't have any, any resources for their children. Putting money in the hands of women is the best thing we can do. Whether it is through stimulus, and putting stimulus in the hands of poor people is fantastic. So unemployment benefits are great. But it is time that we really talk about uh, the, the minimum wage it should be $15 an hour. The, the, a mother of uh, three children or even a, a couple with two children at the minimum wage, they do not uh, make enough money to be out of poverty on the current minimum wage. And that minimum wage doesn't really put people into middle class or into able to meet all their basic needs. An Economic Policy Institute um, budget calculator has calculated a family of four in Memphis needs about $70,000. Mm. Well, and there's something that you touched on in addition to how this impacts women, um, how it impacts minorities. Being a majority minority city, of course, in the same time that we experienced the global pandemic, our world also experienced sort of an awakening around the area of racial justice. So tell us about how poverty and racial justice intersect. Well, we have uh, the disparities that we have, but the reality is that there are a lot of programs to support family that we could, families that we could be implementing, and we don't, in, in part, because people say, well, it's easy to implement that in Sweden because everybody looks the same. A lot of the times we do not want to pay the taxes we need to pay to provide the community supports because we don't want to help those people. Uh, racism is a very important component of our opposition to community services or, or social supports for working people. And it is also a tremendous reason why people would oppose things like uh, the increased unemployment benefits. Why would we deny ourselves higher unemployment benefits that come from the federal government? Blows my mind. 
but racism plays a huge part of it. And the fact that those benefits would go to those people um, it's, it's an enormous part of it. Well, there, but it's well, not really well, otherism um, because you say in your poverty fact sheet that we cannot, as a society, have such a high poverty rate and not have it affect all of us. Tell us a little bit about your shared risk and shared prosperity thinking. So, what happens when you have a city with 30% uh, people in poverty is that businesses do not do as well as they can. Uh, children cannot pay attention in school as well as they could. This has a lot of downstream effects on the rest of society. So you're the owner of a small business. You're not going to be doing as well as in a community that is more prosperous in general. You're not going to be able to get the employees that you need. If you're the owner of a small business, if you have a business and transportation is so dismal and childcare is so dismal that people cannot come to work on time and they cannot afford to go to work, you are going to suffer the consequences, A, in the inability to have the employees that you need and B, in having a lot fewer customers. Uh, Henry Ford knew this over a hundred years ago. And he said, unless I pay my workers enough money so that they can buy my cars, my company is not going to su succeed and thrive. And so unless we understand that the public transportation system is for all of us, and that when we all do better, we all do better, that instead of thinking i don't want those people to have x y benefit we think this benefit is for the entire community in um, increased sales increased economic prosperity for all that spills to all sorts of businesses reduce crime better educated people um children who are going to ex be exposed to a lot less trauma. And, and children that will be well fed and not experience food insecurity. I want to thank you, Dr. De La Vega, for coming and sharing your expertise with us today. I encourage everyone to go find your poverty fact sheet on the web, and it goes back for many years. They are fascinating reads. They break things down by zip code, and it shows the effects that ripple throughout our county when we ignore poverty and food insecurity is just the tip of the iceberg. So thank you, I appreciate you being here today. Thank you for having me. The terrible truth is this, our neighbors were going hungry. You might not wanna see it or might not want to, but it's there. Children virtual schooling away from reliable hot meals are hungry. Seniors debating paying medical bills or grocery bills are going hungry. Single parents who are suddenly out of work are going hungry to feed their kids instead. But there is hope thanks to the folks like Brian and thanks to the researchers like Dr. De La Vega. You can have a direct impact on your neighbors in need by finding a way to give back. Whether you donate canned goods, volunteer your time, or tag your representative on Twitter and tell them what is happening, tell them the facts, you can make a difference for the better. I hope you've enjoyed the first episode of Public Square. If you'd like more information on our programming, you can check us out on the web at ghstv.org, where we are streaming 24 hours a day. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you for watching Public Square, and we'll see you next month.